scientific research directly to the people without interference of any other type of intermediate media. It tries to create a night culture that evolves around knowledge, entertainment, discussion, cocktails and art. Tonight's lecture will be given by Professor Paul Martin Holm from the Department of Geology and Geography of Copenhagen University. His talk will touch the topics of supervolcanoes and super eruptions, large volcanic explosions that if happen to occur, change the climate, will make species extinct. Later, 
artists Deborah Lehmans and Ole Christensen, who focus on sound, performance, installation, and software art, will give a music doomsday performance together with a video projection that will try to make sense out of the predictions of the 2012 movement and the possible endings for mankind on the 21st of December of 2012. Reality will be reinterpreted lively by the artist Henrik Schutzen. End of transmission. Okay, an applause to uh, Professor Paul Martin Holm. Please. Good evening. I'll try to explain to you some of the big processes that goes that go on on this planet, this very dynamic planet, and which sometimes uh, result in very large uh, energy releases on the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> I have to give you some background information for you to understand some of the things behind these processes. But uh, in the end, it's just a story about uh, these big volcanic eruptions. So every year, there's about uh, 50 to 80 volcanic eruptions on this planet, and uh, about 60 in average. And not all of them are very violent. There are about 500 active volcanoes known, and many hundreds of millions of people live within uh, 100 kilometers of such volcanoes. Here we see the population on the x-axis, and up here we have the, the number of volcanoes, and you can see there's a lot of volcanoes here, w which are in areas where more than 100,000 people are living. So um, if the eruptions are big enough, they are of some concern. <clears throat> Volcanoes as such, they, they are built uh, by rocks formed from what we call magma that is erupted through a, a vent. As you can see here, we have a small volcano here and there's a, a vent and a crater uh, around it and there's some magma coming out and here the magma is actually disintegrated into small particles. I'll come back to that a lot. <clears throat> The volcanic vent is uh, the outlet of uh, a feeder tube which transports magma to the surface from a magma chamber, which is usually situated some kilometers below the volcano. Um, I'm going to give you a short geological background for volcanism and an introduction to magma. Then I'll talk a little about volcanoes and eruptions in general, and then I'll go over to eruption size and something called calderas, which are important to the very large eruptions. And then I'll show you some examples of very large eruptions and also hazards and precautions which are related to these. The basic thing for volcanism is the heat produced in the interior of the Earth. And that heat is mainly produced by the decay of radioactive elements naturally decaying elements. They are not so uh, radioactive anymore as they were when the, the Earth uh, was uh, formed four and a half billion years ago, but there's still plenty of heat being produced. Also, as uh, the Earth is cooling, there's crystallization in the core. The outer core is molten, and the inner core is solid, and the solid inner Earth is crystallizing and becoming a larger and larger proportion of the core, and that crystallization generates heat. The heat is transported to the surface of the Earth, both by what we call convection, which is moving of hot material to cooler surroundings, 
and by conduction, which is the leading heat through a stationary medium. And convection in the Earth mantle, which I'll tell you what it is if you don't know it, um, is coupled with the movement of the outer layer of the Earth, the outer layer where we are staying, which you may know is moving around, and is very in intimately coupled to the, the movements of the Earth mantle. And this is the basic cause for the generation of magma that leads to volcanism. <clears throat> we have a very dynamic planet, unlike, unlike Mars or the Moon. Um, and there are some plates on top of the Earth. Um, here we have a cross section of the Earth. We have the, the core. And we have the mantle, which constitutes most of the mass of the Earth, more than 80%. And then we have the most part of the Earth, which is called the crust, where we are living, with granites and sediments and things. And up here you can see that the outer part of the, the Earth is actually both the crust and some part of the mantle, which is solid, called the lithosphere. And the lithospheric plates, they are stiff, and they move around because the inner part of the, the Earth, the, the mantle here below the lithosphere is moving in order to transport heat from deep in the Earth. It's coming up here, going to the sides, and giving off heat to the bottom of the lithosphere. And these movements make the lithospheric plates move. Sometimes they are subducted, and sometimes they are split in the middle, and sometimes other things happen. But this splitting of lithospheric plates, that is the base one of the places where magmas are formed. Also here, when the plates go down, there's some reaction taking place where we have magma forming here. And then we have sometimes unusually warm mantle is rising and starting to melt. So there are three places where we have magmas forming. Namely, as a repetition, separation of two plates, subduction of plates, and diapirs of extra hot mantle. Earthquakes, they are formed because of these plates moving around, especially when they collide, we get earthquakes. Volcanic eruptions. This part of the mantle is called the asthenosphere below the lithosphere. And the, lis the, the asthenosphere has a temperature which is just around 1300 degrees. And at that temperature, the mantle is just ready to melt. It doesn't melt unless something happens. And one thing that can happen is that if the plates are moving apart, are breaking up, then the hot mantle inside, the 1300 degrees hot mantle is rising to a lower pressure and then it starts to melt. If you have subduction of an oceanic plate into the mantle, it takes with it some water and that water is heated uh, and at the surface of this subducted plate and goes into the overlying mantle and that also makes the mantle melt. And then we have the last instance, namely where we have some very hot mantle rising towards the surface but being stopped by the lithosphere. Diapirs of very hot mantle come up and it also starts to melt. And these melts are transported to the surface and out on the surface and that is volcanism. There are many volcanoes on the earth. Only a few of them, maybe 60 erupt every year. And you can see they are aligned around here, the Pacific Ocean, to America here, North America, South America. And this Pacific plate is being subducted here and over here at New Zealand and along Japan, for instance. The Pacific plate is moving and being subducted, and that's why we have the volcanoes. Also here in South America, we have this Nazca plate, as it's called is moving onto South America and creating all these volcanoes. In the mid-Atlantic, we have the two plates, the South American plate and the African plate, moving e apart. 
and we have volcanism all along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Up here is the North American plate and the Eurasian plate moving apart and creating volcanism all the way here. Then there are some hotspots. Hawaii, for instance, Iceland, the Azores, the Cape Verde Islands. You can see the number of them. That's where very hot mantle is coming up. So that's where we have the volcanoes. The molten rock, the molten mantle rock that comes up is what we call magma. And you can see, you can take it up. If you have a volcanic eruption, here's a lava flowing by and somebody has taken a piece of the lava. You can see it's still red glowing because it's still hot. When it's uh, coming on out on the surface, it's typically about 8 to 1200 degrees centigrade hot. The entire crust is made from magma coming out of the mantle, being deposited on the surface of the mantle, slowly creating the crust we are living on. It can be eroded and we can have sediments formed from the decomposed volcanic rocks. Also we have some magmas that don't come out onto the surface in volcanic eruptions, just cool in the lower in the crust and make, for instance, granites. And also when the plates are colliding, we may have deformation of the crust and we get some rocks which are deformed. So there are various forms of rocks, but all rocks, they origin in by crystallization of magma from the mantle. When the red glowing magma is extruded into the atmosphere or into the sea, it experiences a large drop in pressure and temperature. It comes from within the earth at large pressures and come out to one atmosphere pressure, or maybe a little more if it's on, on the ocean, bottom of the ocean. And the pressure drops from maybe a thousand degrees to zero degrees. And there's a lot of reactions taking place because of that. And sometimes these reactions are very violent sometimes even catastrophic. There are different types of eruptions. Eruptions where the magma just flows onto the surface called effusive, and here's a lava flow moving across a, a field, and you can see persons standing nearby watching. A few years ago, we had explosions in Iceland. Here's the Eyjafjallajökull, where the magma did not enter the surface in a subdued manner, but exploded. So it can become very violent. And in this case, the magma is fragmented into small uh, fragments. And that leads to the, the main types of eruptions. Um, here we have a Hawaiian type of eruption where magma just is coming to the surface and flowing to the sides. Here we have a Strombolian eruption where we have small explosions. We have something called a Vulcanian eruption where there's a bit more explosion power in it. And here we have the largest eruptions, the Plinian eruptions called after Pliny uh, the Younger, who described the eruption of Vesuvius in the year 79. And these eruptions they can be extremely violent. This is a typical Hawaiian type of eruption where magma is flowing and it's, of course, red glowing when it's uh, exposed and it quickly cools and actually runs below the surface. Now the important process of fragmentation is taking place typically in this feeder channel below the volcano. This is a volcano and this is the crater and you have the, the vent here where the magma is coming out. And in this magma we have a lot of elements which are um, constituting the magma. And some, some of these elements, they're just part of the magma, the molten magma at depth. But when the magma comes towards the surface, these elements prefer to be 
gases. Water, for instance, is dissolved in, in the magma here. But when it rises into this feeder channel here, there's a, a place where the pressure is coming to a lower uh, value, where the water is exsolved as a separate phase. And water is the most important of all the gases because there's most water of all the gases dissolved in the magma. And it may form bubbles. If the magma is very liquid, these bubbles may just come out of the magma as when you open a bottle of uh, champagne or whatever you want to, to open. The bubbles which are, were dissolved as part of the liquids of the champagne at high pressures come out now as bubbles and they just pass through the liquid. If the liquid is not so liquid but very um, viscous, the bubbles may have larger difficulty in coming out. Also, how many bubbles are there? If there's a lot of water, there will be a lot of bubbles. And then if the magma rises slowly, the bubbles will have more time to come out. But if the magma rises very quickly, the bubbles have, haven't got time. So if the magma is, is very viscous, if the magma rises very quickly, and if there's a lot of volatile elements, as we call them, in the magma, this may end in this way, where the bubbles are actually exploding out of the magma and fragmenting the magma. So we have small droplets of magma coming out here instead. And we, then we get an eruption column coming out of the volcano. And now we have an explosive eruption, as the one we had in Eyjafjallajökull. you could. This is a pretty peaceful eruption of Etna here. And you can see the magma is standing out of the vent several hundred meters up in the air. And it's just magma coming out, and it's coming out so quickly because there's a lot of bubbles, but they're getting out. There's no explosion here. And you can see the lava is flowing here. It just falls onto the ground and makes a lava flow, and it continues to flow. And actually, you can see all the gases, they're still coming out of the magma. They don't all come out immediately. It takes some time. So fire fountains is something you can see in Hawaii, for instance, or in Etna. If you go to Stromboli, you'll see something else. You'll see small explosions. At Stromboli, the island of Stromboli in the Mediterranean, you can actually go to the top of the volcano and sit down here and look at these explosions where magma is ejected out of the vent in this way. And you can see it's red glowing here, and then it quickly cools. And the disintegrated parts of the magma is forming small pieces of rock that falls to the ground and actually form this cone here. So this is a Strombolian eruption. Pretty peaceful, but still an explosion. Fragment sizes, you may have small fragments. We call them ash. It has nothing to do with ash, but we call them ash. It was believed to be ash, but it's small fragments of stone, and they were first small drops of magma when they formed, less than two millimeters. The, the bigger ones we call lapilli, and the big ones we call bombs. And here's a four meter long bomb, you can see, fallen at the volcano. Um, yes. We sometimes refer to these fragments as pyroclasts. pyroclasts. So these are all pyroclastic rocks. Sometimes eruptions get very violent. Sometimes there's a lot of magma that wants to come out very quickly. This is the eruption in 1991 of the volcano Pinatubo from the, on the Philippines. And this is a Plinian eruption where the eruption column is rising, still rising here in the early stages of the eruption, but it will rise to maybe 20 or 30 kilometers height in the atmosphere. And why does it rise? The fragments rise because there's so much hot material, so much many hot drops that they heat the atmosphere around them. And the atmosphere getting hotter is expanding, getting a, a lower density. And the whole thing is rising, carrying all the small particles high up into the air. 
The bigger particles, they, they fall around the volcanoes, but the small particles, they can be carried up on to a high um, level, and then it will flatten out, and they can be carried all around the globe before they fall down. So we have an explosion, we have a, an eruption column rising, and then at some states it, it, it gets the same density as the surrounding atmosphere, and then it just makes a cloud with a lot of ash and things in it, and it, it goes along with the wind. Sometimes there's so much material that we can't sustain this eruption column and the whole thing collapses. Then the hot material come, falls onto the volcano and go down in slopes. This is called a, a glowing avalanche or pyroclastic flow. Here's a photo of a pyroclastic flow. It's taken in 1904 on uh, Montpellier, on Martinique. And here we see such a cloud coming down the slope of the volcano. And this was in 1904, two years before, a similar cloud went into the town of uh, St. Pierre on Martinique and killed uh, 30,000 people. These small particles getting into your lungs, they will kill you instantly. So we have Hawaiian, ex Hawaiian style eruptions, which are purely effusive or with some fountaining. We have Strombolian, small explosions, Vulcanian, large explosions, Plinian, very large explosions, and eruption columns. They are more than 20 kilometers up in the atmosphere. And then we have something called Ultraplinian, the largest eruption types. And here the eruption column may rise on up to 55 kilometers in the atmosphere, actually into the stratosphere where there's no water, no clouds, so the particles will not be washed out by rain and they can stay there for years. How much ash comes out of a vol volcano? Well, the AF Gatelyukul eruption a few years ago in Iceland, which sent fine particles down here and stopped the aircraft, it constituted about 0.1 cubic kilometers of fine particles. If we had this amount distributed in Copenhagen, we would have a layer of one meter thickness. So it's about this thick all over Copenhagen's commune. So even if it's 0.1 cubic kilometers, it would be quite a heap of things which would make life very difficult in Copenhagen, especially if you went on bicycle, I think. <laughs> Some eruptions, they have one cubic kilometer of ash, and that would then make a layer of 13 meters here. So that's approximately as this house. <laughs> and the largest eruptions, they are maybe having amounts of material which are more than a thousand cubic kilometers. And if we distributed a thousand cubic kilometers all over Denmark, it would be a layer which was 23 meters thick. So the large eruptions, they send out a lot of material. There's another scale, I showed you the scale with Hawaiian, Strombolian, and Plinian eruptions. Now I show you another scale called the VEI scalar, the Volcanic Explosivity Index scalar, uh, scale. And uh, here we go from zero upwards, and the points uh, on the way, they are coming up here. Here we have 0.1 cubic kilometer between three and four on the VEI scale, and that's Eiffel-Jökull. Maybe some of you have heard about a volcano called Mount St. Helens, which erupted in the United States in 1980. Was taught a lot about it at that time. That was almost one cubic kilometer. I showed you some pictures of Pinatubo eruption. It erupted about 10 cubic kilometers of ash in 1991. So it was just at the verge of VI6. The largest historical eruption on the Earth is the Tambora eruption in 1815, which sent out probably more than 100 cubic kilometers of um, 
fragmental material, of pyroclastic material. Why is it not known precisely? A lot of it fell into the sea. Uh, and also, you should be aware that when you go back into the past, all this ash, which is deposited on the surface of the earth, is actually quickly washed away by rain and carried by rivers into the sea. So the longer we go back into the past, the, the less information we get about these violent er eruptions. <clears throat> they have a tendency to be underrepresented in, in the old records. One of the largest eruptions we know of is the Yellowstone caldera, uh, which formed about 600,000 years ago, and it was about 1,000 cubic kilometer of material erupted. Here we have 100 cubic kilometer, and that's quite a jump to, to the big ones. And I'll tell you a bit more about the Yellowstone explosion when you come further on. Here we have the Sambora eruption, here we have Java and Indonesia, uh, and here we have on Subawa we have the Sambora volcano, and you can see the thickness of the ash deposited. Here we have more than a meter of ash, and then we have here 25 centimeters, and out here many 500 kilometers away, or actually it's a thousand kilometers away, we have one centimeter of ash. So it decreases with the distance to the volcano. If we are no close to the volcano, we can get very thick deposits. Here we have about 20 meters of pumice from a Plinian eruption. And we can get a lot of things here near the volcanoes. Here's a list of the most voluminous explosive eruptions we know. The biggest one is having about 5,000 cubic kilometers of pumice, actually, and if it's calculated back to dense volume without all the, the bubbles still present in it, it's 4,500 cubic kilometers, still a lot. Here we have the Yellowstone uh, eruption. One, actually, there are more with Yellowstone eruption. That's one of them. You can, you can see it's more than 2,000 cubic kilometers of material. <clears throat> to get this amount of material out of a volcano can't be done if you just have one filter and a volcanic vent. Something else has to happen. And what happens is that if you have a magma chamber here, that's volcanoes, that's cross sections through a volcano, and you have an eruption, then maybe the roof of the magma chamber collapses. And if it collapses like this, a lot of fractures are made, and the eruption starts to take place all along these fractures. And in that case, you can have large amounts of the magma in the magma chamber erupted in a very short time. And that is what is needed, is needed if you want to get rid of a thousand cubic kilometers of material in an explosive way. Also, of course, you have to have a very big magma chamber. So big magma chamber, and you have to have it lying here high in the crust, and you have to have a collapse of the, of the roof. Yeah, we, we call this a caldera. It means a kettle in Spanish, or Portuguese, um, or Italian. Here we have, uh, a, on the Cape Verde Islands, a very nice uh, caldera on one of the islands of Fogo. And there's a one kilometer high wall of the caldera. You can see this is a floor of the caldera. And these are old lavas, which are now exposed in the volcano because the whole thing has collapsed. Actually, a new volcano is being built inside. We are standing at the side of the new volcano here. But we can see this large wall of the caldera. Here we are in Argentina, where we have the Maipo volcano being built on the floor of a large caldera, the Diamante caldera. And you can see this, the walls of the caldera here, some more photos, caldera walls, half a million years ago, 450 cubic kilometers were erupted here. And the caldera size is 12 by 18 kilometers. Here we are about 100 kilometers away, and we can see the deposits from this big eruption. 
thick layers of ash, and it was actually so hot that when it cooled, it coalesced, and these, uh, when it cooled, it could make these columns here. This is a photo of a remnant on the outer slopes of the volcano. One of the largest eruptions was the Toba eruption uh, 73,000 years ago. It's on Sumatra here, the island of Sumatra in Indonesia again, Toba. And there's a big lake now where the eruption took place. And we had an enormous amount of material deposited. About 2,700 cubic kilometers of material was dispersed. And here we can see, for instance, that 1,100 kilometers from Toba, 1,100 kilometers from Toba, the thickness of the ash layer is 34 centimeters. Remember this number because I'll come back to it. During the Toba eruption, there was so much material in the air, in the atmosphere, that it blocked the sun's, sun's ray out. So there was a cooling at the surface of the Earth, and there has been some calculations of what was the effect of this. And here's an example of some calculations where we have the annual variation, and then we have a, a drop of temperature of, in this case, 15 to 20 degrees, and then it comes back after a number of years. So here we have, for more than 10 years, there was a decrease in temperature by more than 10 degrees on average. That was the effect of the Toba eruption. Um, these kinds of eruptions will have a devastating effect on life. It has been um, suggested that this eruption almost kills human beings, but um, it seems that some actually manage very well, but the, the, this <laughs> we are sitting here. But the, there seems to be a a genetic narrowing of the, of the genes, telling us that not so many were surviving at this point. This is still being discussed. Going to Italy, here we have Italy. There's a lot of volcanoes in Italy. Some of them are active. A lot of young volcanoes north of Rome and south of Rome. Napoli, Vesuvius, and here we have Campi Fligre, which I'll come back to. Here we have Etna. The Olean Islands with Stromboli, for instance. Vesuvius you know of, artist impression, actually a painting of Vesuvius. And the Bay of Naples here, Vesuvius is here, that's the 79 eruption, Plinian eruption. But more interesting, out here we have Campi Fligre, which is having one big caldera here, and a lot of smaller calderas inside. This is an extremely unstable area where we have had enormous eruptions in the past. 39 million years ago, uh, thousand years ago, we had a, a VEI 7 eruption of 150 cubic kilometers of material. And actually today, there's a lot of vertical movement of the ground here. Some Roman temples, they keep coming out of the water and sinking in again as the magma is moving below. This town of Puzzoli was much destroyed by earthquakes from this movement of magma and is now deserted. And it is actually the biggest uh, hazard of Europe today, volcanically. This can be free gray. And a lot, uh, it's, it's very fertile, there's a lot of people living here hundreds of thousands, and you know in Napoli there's, uh, here, there's many millions of people living. So in this whole area, it's um, actually not the best place to be if you fear a volcanic eruption. <laughs> <clears throat> what is the, the, the hazards? What is the effects of, of these big explosive eruptions? Well, you can be buried by them, obviously, uh, by pyroclastic fall, and if you have a pyroclastic flow, you don't have to wait very long, you are killed immediately. Also, the ash deposited on volcano surfaces uh, may be mobilized by rain, and mud flows may form, mud flows that are thick with ash, and 
if they um, flood habitated areas, people are actually getting stuck in the mud, which is uh, solidifying as concrete and is very dangerous too. The darkness is killing plants and thereby making life very difficult for all of us. Also, if it gets cold, we are having problems. Actually, some kinds of volcanic eruptions may raise the temperature, but most will just cool. Vesuvius in 79, we have Pompeii was destroyed. Here's had been uncovered, dug out, and you can see all the roofs there, they are gone by the, the weight of the pyroclastic material, but inside the whole thing is preserved. And here you can see a house being dug out, but it's still part of it is still in this big, uh, this big pyroclastic layer, tough. Here we have Martinique, which I talked about previously in 1902. That's the town before it was hit by a glowing avalanche, and this is a town afterwards. 30,000 30, people killed instantly. Mud flows, they are highly underestimated in how dangerous they are. Here's a mud flow entering the town of Amero in uh, 1985. Mud flow being generated because of ice melting at a volcano erupting nearby. 25,000 people were killed. <clears throat> I haven't told you about aerosols. I told you about ash particles filtering the sun rays so they don't get to the surface. The ash actually comes out of the atmosphere after maybe months, typically months. It may be stay for, for years, but usually not. But what stays it for years is some of the volatiles, some of the gases coming out of the eruption. They form small droplets, sulfur gases, um, reacting with water in the atmosphere, forming sulfuric acid, coming into the stratosphere as small droplets in huge amounts, blo blocking out the sun and reflecting the sun. And they are actually more dangerous than the ash particles themselves. Big eruptions may lead to decrease in temperature on the Earth, and maybe it doesn't last for many years, but it may be just what it takes to get an ice age triggered. So many geologists today believe that maybe volcanic eruptions themselves are not able to extinct life on Earth, but maybe an uh, ice age can be uh, triggered by it and have uh, devastating effects on another scale. So uh, global cooling may come from aerosols and ash, um, and ash may also devastate large areas by the fall of it, and glowing avalanches are especially dangerous in the vicinity of the volcano. Um, another gas which may result from volcanic eruptions is methane. Methane being present in sediments on the seafloor if magma is coming towards the surface and intruded into the sediments, it may heat the sediments and they give off a lot of methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas much more potent than CO2, and that may lead to global warming. And it led to global warming about 56 million years ago. So, magma may have effects in two directions. Can we forecast these things? Um, we can look, we can try to predict a volcanic eruption by having knowledge of the magma moving under our feet. And how can we detect that? We can detect it by magma cracking rocks, creating small earthquakes. We can detect magma coming towards the surface, making a bulge on the surface of the earth. It's doming and you can measure the doming of the surface of the earth over the, the magma, rising magma. Also, the magma, as it comes towards the surface, it starts to give off some of these gases, and you can measure the gas composition over 
uh, on volcanoes to see if something is happening. However, the magma moving towards the surface sometimes doesn't erupt. It just stops, gets stuck, crystallizes, cools. And that's a big problem because when you know that magma is moving, should you sound the alarm or not? And it's very difficult to know. Here we have some geologists sampling gases at a volcano. Here we have some size thermometers measuring small earthquakes at volcanoes. And there's a lot of volcanoes around the Pacific, for instance, here, and they are being monitored. For instance, you can see there's an eruption taking place in Hawaii. There are some volcanoes which are on the verge of erupting. And then there's a lot of active volcanoes, the green ones, which are not actually erupting now, and the white triangles, they are extinct, we think. And here we have the Yellowstone volcano, active but not it erupts very soon. It's not possible to forecast precisely. We can issue a warning. When the magma is coming very close to the surface, you can be sure it's coming up at a certain stage. But predictions, they remain uncertain, especially it's hard to time them accurately. So it will also always be a political decision whether to evacuate people or not. Should the people of Napoli be told to go away? You're, everybody fears what would happen if you tell five million people to move. Certainly, it's probably impossible to move them. You can make um, maps of where it's dangerous to be in the vicinity of a volcano, and you can try to avoid building houses or factories in such places. So it's actually possible to avoid some of the, the hazards from uh, volcanic, future volcanic eruptions, but it's, it's not possible to, to forecast them with precision. And it, it's definitely not possible to prevent them. Now, uh, two examples. What time do we have? A little time. Yellowstone, Wyoming, United States, a national park. This is the site of, of one of the currently active volcanoes that have experienced already super eruptions. Super eruptions is what we call the biggest eruptions, the VEI 7 or 8 or bigger. Yellowstone is underlain by a huge magma chamber. The roof of the magma chamber has already collapsed on three occasions. So there's a high probability of a future super eruption from the Yellowstone caldera, as there is in Campi Flegrei in Italy. Here we have a map showing the three Yellowstone calderas. 2.1 million years ago, there was a big eruption, the biggest one. Then at 1.3 million years, we had a tenth of this size, but still very, very large eruption. And then the third eruption, 600,000 years ago, 1,000 cubic kilometers. If you subtract these ages from each other, you can see that we might expect an eruption yesterday or tomorrow. <laughs> but we can't, we can't predict it. The pyroclastics, the ash, that came from the last two Yellowstone eruptions are shown here. And you can see these two, here's the third one, they covered half of the United States to various degrees. If it happened today, it would be a, a total disaster for the United States and probably it would have some effects on the climate. So what is going on in Yellowstone today? Yeah, we have a, we have a big anomaly here in gravity. So this part of the United States is sticking up because it's hot and it has a low density. So there's really something anomalous here. Here we have a kind of map where you can see the Yellowstone caldera, the last caldera here, and you have the Yellowstone National Park. 
Here we see how much heat is coming out on, the, of the ground, on, on top of the ground. And you can see there's, here, this is the United States, some of the northwestern part. This is Yellowstone. And you can see there's a hot finger here where the hottest part is under Yellowstone today. And you can see it's very hot here. There's coming heat out here, heat out of Yellowstone, of the ground in Yellowstone, which is four times the normal amount of heat coming out of the ground. It has been possible to model what is going on. Here we have uh, the Yellowstone caldera here on top, and here we have the magma chamber. This part of the magma chamber is saturated with gas, so it might stay, start making bubbles if it starts to move towards the surface. Here's some more magma, a lot of crystals in it, but still a huge magma chamber, and you can see it's situated up to a few kilometers below Yellowstone, and then it extends deep into the crust. There's been many movements over the years. It has been measured since 1923. There's a lot of movement which has been measured. And to sum it up, since 1975, you can see the ground in Yellowstone has been going up and down and up and down. And then in 2004, it started to go up very steeply. And there was actually concern that now the magma was rising to the surface and we had another explosion, but in the last few years it has turned around and it's starting to go down again. But one day it will happen. Here's something called, here's a kind of radar photo of Yellowstone and all these rings here show that the ground is moving towards us from a, from a satellite. Each of these rings represent three centimeters, so you can see it's about a 20 centimeter rise of the ground. But it's 600,000 years since anything happened here in Yellowstone of explosive character. What has happened instead is there's been some small lava flows, which are shown here. And there's a lot of heat coming out. There's a geyser called Old, Old Faithful in Yellowstone. There's a lot of hot springs in Yellowstone and a lot of hot water with strange bacterial growth in them. And what is taking place is that in Yellowstone, this is a drawing from the, from the ocean floor, but in Yellowstone we have the lithosphere and we have a, a rising plume of hot uh, mantle coming up and it starts to melt under the lithosphere in the United States and the melts come up. And actually, it's possible to model geophysically by measurements of earthquakes that this is the actual form of this mantle rising from 700 kilometers towards the crust. And we can see the American plate is moving in that direction and, and the plume is staying in the same place. So as the American plate is drifting this way, the plume stays here, so it sort of burns its way from 17 million years ago, six, seven, four, one, and here we are today, and that's earthquakes taking place. So we are just on top of a big supplier of magma and a big magma chamber. So this is the situation that it is, it is envisaged to take place. I'll go on, time is running. Because I want to, to finish off by telling you that actually here in Denmark, we have a unique display of some very large eruptions, more than a hundred super eruptions took place close to where we are today. There are about 200 ash layers which can be found in exposures of older rocks, actually 55 million years old rocks in Denmark. Here are all the ash layers measured by geologists and the main outcrops, they are around the Limfjorn in northern Denmark. They are, they, are, they are very well preserved and I'll show you some of them. You see all these locations, this is Mors and this is Limfjorn here and Thy uh, up here and that's the rest of Jutland coming down here. All these locations, they display these as layers. I think it's not easy to, to see them here, but 
Here we have a close-up of something called Scarpe Clint. And here you can see the sediment which was 55 million years ago on the bottom of a not too deep sea. But as the sediments, they sedimented on the bottom of the sea, occasionally there was ash coming down. And this occasionally was actually 200 times. There were enormous eruptions that sent ash over Denmark forming layers, some of them may be one millimeter thick, others they are 20 centimeters thick. So 20 centimeters of ash is quite something. If, if we had that today, that would stop everything. And there's some more locations here. You can see the ash layers. Here they have actually been folded by the ice or during the last ice age, but all these dark layers, they are ash. More of them, they've been numbered. Sometimes they are preserved in, in uh, calcareous rocks. And here's a big, thick layer, 15 centimeters thick. So there are about more than 200 layers of ash, and the total thickness of ash is 4.3 meters. And each, layers, each layer may vary from 20 centimeters down to, to nothing. If we look in the North Sea, you know, they're drilling for oil out there, so they have been drilling many places, and these ash layers, they're found all over the place. Here's, here are all the locations. This is Norway and Denmark here, and so you can actually see the ash layers, they get thicker and thicker as you go to the Northwest. And 55 million years ago, there were no Atlantic Ocean. The pharaohs were lying very close to Greenland, Here we have Greenland, here we have the Atlantic Ocean forming, the ocean bottom being formed, the new ocean floor forming, and at 56 million years ago, the ocean started to form here between Norway and Greenland, between Scotland and Greenland, and the, between the Faroes and Greenland. And when this happened, when this went up here, enormous eruptions started. Eruptions which are found by lava flows, seven kilometers thick thickness of lava flows in East Greenland. And the Faroes, we also have five kilometers of lava that's exposed. So what happened? The North Atlantic formed, and why did we have all this volcanism making all these basalts in East Greenland and the Faroes? That was because the hot mantle now forming Iceland, the Icelandic mantle plume was start, just starting its activity at that time. You see, this is as Greenland moves west, the relative position of this hotspot is moving to the sea, to, the, to Iceland where we have it today. So when the continent split, we had a lot of eruptions taking place. And actually, as these eruptions stopped, these lava flows stopped. We had these 200 or more Plinian or ultra Plinian super eruptions, which we can find in the Danish ash layers today. So that 1200 kilometers away, we have thicknesses of up to 20 centimeters. And that was why I asked you to remember the 34 centimeters from the big Toba eruption, uh, 70. 3,000 years ago in Sumatra, you could 1,100 kilometers away, you found 34 uh, centimeters of ash, and that was about 1,000 cubic kilometers of material erupted. So probably the thickest Danish ash layers there were from eruptions out here of 1,000 cubic kilometers, but unlike the situation we see in other places, we didn't have one eruption. We have maybe more than 100 eruptions of this size. So this was really a marvelous geological experience, but I'm happy we didn't live there at that time. The last here is, uh, if we add up all the ash layers, we can see that the upper part of the, the, the ash layers constitute 2.8 meters of ash, and then it increases as we go towards this place. Here it's eight meters up here. 
So there's no doubt that the uh, cytal eruption was the initial eruptions of the Iceland mantle plume. So that's about it. If you want to know more about volcanoes and read Danish, I'm actually having a book coming out later this month. If it has your interest, you can read that. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you, Jay and Paul, for this very fine lecture on super volcanoes. Is everybody aware of what will happen in 80 days? December 21st, 2012. Could we put out the lights a bit in on the side because this is important information. Yes. And a bit more volume. So in 80 days, December 21st, I've heard that on this date, the world might end. I've also heard that we will go through a transformation. My name is Deborah and this is Ola. And together we went on an expedition to Mexico to find the Maya prophecy. All right, this experience is in 3D, so you need your 3D glasses. If you don't have 3D glasses, they are delivered there from Yon. And please, Put them back on, I mean, deliver them back to us when we are finished. So now we will show you some video material and some music from our show, which is called Getting Back in the Hole. I will strongly advise everybody in this room here to come and see the whole performance because this is just the release we have the premiere in 20 days and then we will perform the performance every 20th day until december 21st which is the last performance and there will also be a doomsday party so there are flyers around in this room. Please pick up one and, and be there. I would suggest you be there. This presentation will last for around 20 minutes.
rejseplanen. Vi landede i går, og øh, vi er i Cancun nu. Øh, I morgen rejser vi så til Cuba, øh, som nogen mener er en af de største byer, Maya-byer på det østlige Yucatan. Her i Yucatan. Øh, den havde sin storhedstid omkring 600-900 efter Kristi. And what is this? I know that's a number, but no, it depends on the count. Oh, it's not 2012. That there is a glyph, there is a glyph. Somebody can say yes, no, eh, no. Later, before. You come just become crazy just about that. Not even about the end of the world. Just the Mayan calendar itself might swallow you. Inside, it has a three small hole inside. Inside, just three small hole. Take to a small window, a small niche in the in the both side. Yes, in the morning, the sunlight came to the narrow hole, like this picture. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's why we know in the the Mayan people they use the observatory, or like the circus. The Mayan people is great astronomer. Yeah. Mathematician. He knowledge about the sun god or the moon god. Just the high class people, rich people. But how would they use it for uh, reading the stars? Or yes. Through the mm -hmm. small holes? Huh? Exactly. Or oh, that's how they measure the time for to grow the, the harvest. Yes, or the, or the grow, the beans, squash. Uh, yes, okay. Mm, or, the most, or the most important days. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Just, just 13, 13 guys right here. Ah, okay. And there's also the the um, Stella one with the, mm -hmm. with the Stella. date. Yeah. Stella number one, the day 2012. Yes. Is the end of the of the world. Do you think it will yes. be the end of the world? Yes. Soy uh, Deborah. Uh, I'm 
Sí. Débora. Débora, tu nombre. Sí, sí, ya. Sí. Débora. Me, pero hablo uh, un poquito español. Sabe un español. Sí. Y maya. Y no. No maya. Vale, vale. ¿Ok? Thank you. 
Some last words here. Stella. Late. Yeah. Next time, Stella number one. The day 2012. Yes. Is the end of the of the world. Do you think so? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. No. Do you think it will yes. be the end of the world? Yes. Oh no. No, I kidding. No, no. Ah, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the Mayan calendar. Yeah. And then start over again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, then it's a new... It's a new era. Okay, so you will celebrate. Exactly. Yes, and now it's time for another cocktail. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you in 20 days and on the 21st of December. <laughs> <laughs>